students have asked many questions and here I will try to answer and comment on some of these questions but also leave some open questions. The first one here is about artifact classifications and why we should care about such classifications. How can they help you? And can you use several classifications? And how many are there? Are there just three? Well, one artifact classification may be the most basic one for this course is to divide artifacts into constructs, models, methods and instantiations. Where constructs are small, atomic pieces, uh, models or aggregations of several constructs and the relationships between them, and methods or ways of working and instantiations or working systems that can be directly used in some practice. Now, you could wonder why would this help? How do they help? Well, the most basic answer could be that artifact classifications help your reader. When you're going to present what you have done, what is your contribution, it's quite helpful to be able to formulate the kind of contribution in a simple and easily understandable way. You tell the reader, okay, I have produced a method and that method will automate some activity. Then the reader will immediately understand what kind of artifact you have produced. And this is much better than just saying, I have produced an artifact. And these classifications we have looked at, they're quite familiar and well known. Many people know about them. So when you describe your artifact using these classifications, many people will rapidly understand what you're doing. But artifact classifications can also help yourself in your work by identifying the type of your artifact. You can then use various checklists for assessing the quality of your artifact. For example, if you say I have produced a model, then you have a list of important quality criteria for that model. It should be consistent, easily understandable, expressive and so on and so on. And you have similar checklists also for other types of artifacts. We will see more about this when we come to requirements. And of course, you can use several classifications. And this is very practical. Simply use the classification or the classifications that will really help you to describe and clarify your artifact for the reader. And are there only three artifact classifications? In, in this course, we have looked at these three construct model method instantiation and function oriented classification and this more pragmatic one. But the short answer is that no, there are many other artifact classifications also. Uh, and in specific domains, you will find very detailed artifact classifications. Okay, and there were also some questions about the design science canvas. Pretty similar questions to the previous one. How does it help? And well, again, an answer is it helps your reader. Because now using this canvas, you can describe your contribution in a very compact and easily understandable way. And therefore you should keep it short and simple. Don't use more than one page for your canvas. And in this way, you also include a context to position your work, which is easy to forget. Sometimes you get carried away with the particular structure of your artifact. But for the reader to understand, you need to also talk about the practice and the problem and the knowledge base used. And furthermore, the canvas helps you not to get bogged down in describing your own research process. It's easy that you start to write some kind of a diary, that you tell exactly what you have done day by day, how your research process has worked out. But this is often not very interesting for the reader. The reader instead needs to know about the stuff you have in the canvas. But again, the Design Science Canvas can also help yourself, in particular if you are in a project 
because the canvas can then be used to keep an updated version of everything that happens in the project, or rather the important things that happen in the project. In a, in a big project, there are always lots of things, small ones and big ones, and you easily get overwhelmed to keep track of all this. The canvas will help you to pinpoint the important stuff, the big issues, and thereby it can keep everyone in the project on the same page. And there was also some question here about the contribution matrix and how to apply it. Sometimes it's tricky to put an artifact into the right place. Okay, here is the contribution matrix and we have then these four different boxes. Routing design, not really design science. It's about known solutions for known problems. The solution is already very high here and it's, it's a well-known practice application domain. Improvement is when you create new solutions for known problems, very common. Invention is radical new solutions for new problems and acceptations. Then you take an existing solution and you move it to a new practice. Okay, sometimes it's very easy to know where to put your artifact. For example, if uh, when someone invented the wheel, that was really something new, there was no pre-existing similar artifact, and it opened up very new practices in transport that didn't exist before, new solution for new problem. But in the left lower corner here, if you have, if you produce and design a new television, well, everyone knows about televisions or Reddit, it's just a very minor improvement to it. And it will not change what people will do. Everyone knows how to use a television. But what about this one? What about a television with a curve, curved television? Well, that is not an invention. It's really not a new problem that is addressed. It uh, improves rather on this existing television and maybe not so much. So you should put it a little above this very simple television. And this shows one point. It's not exactly about putting into it into exactly one or to put a, a new an artifact into exactly one of these boxes. It is more a continuum here and you can move it around there. Let's see another example that's more clear on that. Here is a 1973, the very first mobile phone. It looked like that clearly. That was an invention. There were no previous mobile phones. And it opened up totally new ways of communicating in a mobile way. Today, when there is a new development or new uh, mobile phone, well, that's routing design. You improve the performance a little bit, but there is nothing really new or inventive about that. But what about this one? What about a foldable phone? Well, that's clearly an improvement. It's not routine, so it's a bit up here. And maybe it's also taking you a little into the invention area, because maybe this will enable people to do completely new things, to address very new problems. and uh, change some practice, or even introduce a new practice. Probably not much, but maybe. And what about a holographic uh, mobile phone? Well, that's even more uh, inventive. It's no more new and it also might open up, very difficult to tell, some new practices. So this shows that you have some kind of continuum where you can put your artifacts and where you put them also the depends on what other artifacts already exist. Okay, another case here. And again, it's the difficulty to draw a borderline, borderline between artifacts and natural objects. Can some object be both natural and artificial? For example here, is the climate an artifact? And to start thinking about that, think about was the climate an artifact 500 years ago? And is it an artifact today? And what are the criteria for deciding upon this? 
Well, I want to take the fun out of this and provide some kind of answer. Instead, I will leave this to you and think more about it. And if you would like to, please share your ideas in, in the discussion forum. Another example here is a pebble, an artifact. Suppose that you walk around on a beach and there you see a nice pebble. You pick it up and you bring it home to you. And then you use it as a paperweight. Well, does this mean that the pebble now has become an artifact? Or is it rather a natural object? What are the criteria for deciding? And as this example illustrates, there isn't if sometimes not really a sharp borderline or a crisp borderline between the artificial and the natural. I mean, sometimes, of course, it's very clear where to put some, something. A tree is a natural object, uh, a mobile phone is artificial, but these examples, they indicate that it's sometimes it's not obvious. So please think about these examples. Here's another case of drawing the borderline. Can knowledge be both definitional and descriptive at the same time? And now just to repeat here, uh, we have said that a definitional knowledge, it's conceptual and structural knowledge. It includes definitions and concepts, constructions, constructs, classifications, and they don't tell you anything about reality. On the other hand, descriptive knowledge, it's knowledge that describes and analyzes existing phenomena. It intends to make true statements. And again, I will not give away the answer here, but just show this question. You have the statement, the atomic number of gold is 79. Is this definitional or descriptive knowledge? It's not obvious. And what are the criteria for deciding between these? And once again, please think about this.